Ms. Langhorn, would you please come up and, and tell me about some of your experiences, especially when it came to um, you all's coming up here, your entrepreneur, entrepreneurialization, you know, you have your own family business and working all year and not making any money. How did that work? Thank you. Well, I was raised in Uniontown, Alabama. Matter of fact, I was born in Uniontown, Alabama. And my dad was a sharecropper. We lived on the white man's place and we shared the crops with him. So my dad and the kids worked all summer long in the cotton field picking cotton. And when we picked the cotton, the white man came and got the cotton and took it to the gin. So my dad never knew how much a bale of cotton was worth. And at the end of the cotton harvest, we weren't allowed to go to school until all the cotton was picked because he would ride up and down the fields and his truck watching us work. And he made sure we worked from sun up to sundown. And at the end of the harvest, he would settle up with my dad. And it was always like, we came out even this year, Julius. Uh, either we, I owe you $100. My dad was always in the red. So we never got any new clothes, and we only got like one pair of shoes per year. And my dad raised the hogs, the corn, the sweet potatoes, the peanuts, the greens, the cabbage, the onions, and the potatoes. We raised all our food. And the only thing my mom had to buy from the grocery store was flour because we took the corn to the mill and we had the farm animals that my dad slaughtered in the, in the wintertime. So we, the only thing my mom had to buy was flour because we had the lard from the hogs and all that stuff. And my mom would work in the white people's house to like 8 or 9 o'clock at night, and she was 14 of us. And she would come home, I remember as a little child, standing at the window, peeking, waiting to see the headlights of the white man's truck to bring my mom home so she could spend some time with us. But she spent all of her day taking care of their kids while they ran and did their business. So she never spent that much time at home with us. And I can remember this one incident. My sister had cut her little finger, and it was hanging almost off. And my dad went to the white man and told him, well, my, my daughter's not going to be able to pick cotton this week because I want her finger to heal. And my sister didn't pick cotton for a week, and that next week it was still sore because sores don't heal that well, especially when you almost cut your finger off. And he demanded that my sister go back to the cotton field with a sore finger. He didn't want her to stay at home and take care of herself. So we was just like slaves, really. My dad was a sharecropper, and he was just like a slave. And I can remember one time this man picked up a crowbar to hit my father. They had a disagreement. And my dad was the kind of person. He was religious. He prayed in front of us, and he took us to church. But he didn't take no mess, and he wasn't afraid of anybody. So when he picked up, the white man picked up the crowbar, my dad picked a hammer up, and he said, we can hold hands and do whatever you want to do. So that night, my dad had to flee for his life. He had to leave the sharecropper's farm and go and stay with another man down on the highway. And my mom said, we have to leave this plantation and move some other place. But my dad was never allowed to come back to that plantation again because he stood up for what he believed that was right. And I can remember when I was a little kid, like the 4th of July celebrations, we had like a community hall. It was something like a barn, but they called it a communion hall, a community hall. And all the slaves, uh, sharecroppers or whatever you may call them, the white man would kill the hogs and the goats and make the gumbo soup and the big cans of Kool-Aid, and we all would go up to the center at a certain time on the 4th of July and eat what he had prepared for us. We ate what he wanted us to eat. We didn't eat what we wanted to eat, and my dad wasn't allowed to even cook, nor my mom on holidays, because he did what he wanted to do. So I felt just like my dad was a slave, and I was a slave. So when I finished school, I left. I left home to get away from that slave mentality that I had been raised around and that had been ingrained in me as a child. I left and I came to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I went to college for four years. I got an education, 
And I had a family. I had four boys and one girl. All of my children went to college. All of them did. And uh, I raised my kids the way my mom had raised me to treat people the way I wanted to be treated. And uh, I brought my, I took my kids to church. I took my kids to church because every, every Sunday morning, we were in Sunday school every Sunday. Not one Sunday, but every Sunday we were in Sunday school. So my mom and dad was real religious. And I can remember as a child hearing my mom on her knees praying. She would get through praying, then my daddy would get down on his knees and pray. So I do the same thing right now. I pray with my kids. I pray in front of my kids. I go to Sunday school every Sunday. Matter of fact, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I teach missionary on Saturday mornings, and I teach a youth group on Mondays. So, and then I also can remember, this is something special. I was always an app kid, what they call us when we were down south. We, I learned my ABCs when I was like four years old. And they didn't have kindergarten and preschool like they have now. They have what they call a pre primer you could go to when you was five years old. And I could spell like cat, dog, rat, mice. I could spell all those things. And I can remember when I was six years old, all of my sisters and brothers would be outside playing on the rainy days when we didn't have to work in the fields or go to school or the church. And I would always be inside reading my Bible. I read my Bible when I was six years old. And I had a favorite story that I used to read about Joseph when he was sold into slavery. And I used to get so involved in it that I seemed like I could just see like the camels coming. When they was coming to take Joseph back to Egypt, I could see him in my little mind. I was only six years old. But I knew now that God had a calling for me, but I didn't realize at the time while I was so enthused about reading the Bible as a kid. But I can say it's only by the grace of God that I'm here today and God has brought me from Alabama as a slave up until this present moment. And I want to give all the praise and all the thanks unto him because didn't nobody do it but him. Thank you. Before you walk away too fast, just had a couple more questions here uh, for you. Or just wait just a little bit here. All right, all right. Now you spent the time in Alabama. You know, when you came to Fort Wayne, how did Fort, how did Fort Wayne impress you or not impress you when you first arrived here? When I came to Fort Wayne, I was impressed with the jobs because the job market was real good. You could work here one day and you could quit that job and you could go tomorrow and find another job. So the job market was real good. You was able to earn your own money and you was able to spend your own money the way you want to spend. And it wasn't like you was working for someone else and they was giving you what they wanted you to have. So I was really impressed with the job market here in Fort Wayne. So at that point in time, it's almost like you had achieved the American dream. Yes. by getting away from your environment where you were. Yes, yes. At what point uh, did the attitudes here in Fort Wayne, uh, did you find them comparable to the ones in Alabama, or was it a better environment between black-white relations when you came here? It was a better relationship because I can remember as a kid, I was like maybe 13 or 14 years old, and they had this um, truck stop in Browns, Alabama, and we used to go down and get hamburgers, and we had to go outside around the building to Lewanda and order our hamburgers, and the white people would go on the inside and sit down and eat, but we couldn't go in, in, inside the restaurant and eat. And I also can remember my mom taking me to the grocery store on the weekend with her, and we would go to the drugstore because they had the best root beer and the best uh, hot dogs, but we always had to go to the back of the drugstore. We couldn't sit, we weren't allowed to sit on the, on the uh, stools at the front of the drugstore. Only the white people sat there and we had to go back to the back of the drugstore and sit at the tables and chairs. So when I came to Fort Wayne, it was a whole different atmosphere and everything was different. You had more freedom here than you had in Alabama. All right, now you know, a lot of people, even today, are afraid to look black people or white people in the eye when they talk to them, when they walk up and communicate with them. And a lot of people have said that that's because in the past, you know, they were, their parents or grandparents were afraid of white people. How did you overcome your fear, if you ever had any fear of people? How, how did you overcome that? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked me that question because I was talking to a friend today 
And when Martin Luther King came in the 60s with the segregation and all that stuff, and we had to integrate and go to school together, I was a, 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 a student at Uniontown Negro Elementary School. And when Martin Luther King came to Montgomery, Alabama, and marched to Selma, they started integrating the schools. And what they would do, they would bring the white kids to my school on a bus for a class with their white teacher. And they would take us to the white kid school with our teacher for a class. And we were never mixed, but we were at the school in a room separated. And when they came to my school, I was so afraid of them. I was so afraid of them because I wasn't used to them. And I knew my dad, they had power over my dad and my mom. And I, was, I wasn't comfortable around them. And I was actually afraid of them because I was, I was thinking that I had heard about the lynching that they did to black people in those days and stuff. And I, when I had to to mix with them, I was afraid of them. I was afraid of them. And when I came to Fort Wayne, I overcame that fear because I knew that I was a child of God. And I read in my Bible that God is no respect of person. He doesn't love me no harder than he loved a black, green, red, purple, uh, orange man. And he looked at all of us the same. He looks at our heart. Man's, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid anymore. And I know I have to love because he said a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. And I know I have to love my white fellow brothers and sisters just like I do my black brothers and sisters. If I want to enter into the kingdom of God, I have to love them regardless of how they treated my father. And that was a real hard, that was an obstacle in my life that I had to overcome. That was something in my life that I had to overcome. I had to learn how to love. And I, when I realized that I had to do it, I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me because I can't do this by myself. I can't do it by myself. I said, you said love your enemies and do good to those that despitefully use you. And I said, I need you to help me because I can't do it by myself. And God helped me to do it. So I've worked. I've had some of the best white friends. I've had some of the best white people to help me when I was raising my kids by myself and stuff. I've had white people to do real nice things for me. But when in, in Alabama, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. It was a, just a whole different atmosphere. And you just had that fear in you. They put it in you because they didn't speak to you. That The white man would ride up and down the sides of the field while, fields while you were working. And he would just bow his head. He never spoke a wave because... He was too much for that, and we was, like, under him, so he never opened his mouth or said anything to us. You know, why do you think, what do you want to tell people? You know, a lot of people want to keep those kind of stories to themselves. You know, people from Arkansas, Mississippi, other parts of Alabama, whatever, they don't like to share what it was like there. Why should they want to share that, you know, to people who never been there, especially? Well, for one thing, they shared so they can look back on where they where they came from. And it's like a dream, and if you don't keep it alive, it someone have to keep it alive. And they're not, they're not gonna teach your kids this in school. They teach them back history, but don't tell them anything about sharecropping. So you have to tell kids, you have to share with the community, and you have to share with anybody. I'm not ashamed of where I came from. I'm not ashamed of who I am and what I am. I'm proud of who I am because God made me in his likeness and his image. And he loved me just as hard as he loved anybody else, regardless of what color they are. So we must keep the story the light burning. We must keep the torch burning so our kids can look back one day and see how far we have come from. Thank you very much. You're welcome.